Matthew chapter 14. I'll tell you, it's been a blessing this week getting over to the uh, tent meeting. I, I like to hear preaching. It, it encourages me. Every preacher has their own style and their own way, but they can be used by the Lord if they proclaim the word of God and, in truth. And I'll tell you, it was a blessing. Uh, my heart was stirred when it comes to this area of the word of God and its importance and just remembering what a precious book it is. You know, how important it is that we, we stand firm on the truths of God's word, that we rest in it. Without the word of God, what do we have to stand on here? It, it, it is, it is the, the foundation that we have for our faith and, and practice. And if we don't understand what we have, we're going to neglect it. We're going to step away from it. And uh, if we step away from the word of God, we fall away from truth. It, it is a dangerous, it is a slippery slope. And I'm not going to preach on that topic this evening, but let me just say, hey, make it a habit, a priority in your life every day. Be in the word of God. You know, get something from it, not just, not just a habit to read through a daily schedule, although that's a good thing for helping to set a habit. That's a wonderful thing. But take a, take a pen and paper, and he, he mentioned this the other night. He said, uh, 60% of think is ink. And it took me a minute. I, I, I wrote that down because I, I know I'm getting old. I, I forget stuff in general. I, I know that's true in my own life. If I don't write things down, I'm going to forget it. I've got sticky notes. I've got three by five cards. If you look inside my calendar that I carry with me in my bag, I've got all sorts of little notes of things that I need to accomplish. I understand that. But he wrote this, you know, 60% of think is ink. And I didn't get that until I wrote it down. And I saw at the end of the word think is I-N-K. And yes, that's three of the five letters. And I put it together and I, I figured it out. I was a little slow that night, but it, it's true. Hey, if you come, it's the same way with preaching. I'm not going to look around and see who has their pens and papers out, but if you come looking for something, the Lord will give you something. He will. If you come to his word in the morning when you're going to read your Bible uh, and, and you say, Lord, Lord, I want you to give me something that's going to help and that I can get from it and you're ready for it, he will give you something. It's the same way with preaching. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the one standing behind the pulpit here today. I come to a message with a pen and paper because I want to get something that the Lord speaks to my heart about. But I'm excited about what the Lord has for us tonight in the book of Matthew. I keep, I was thinking today when I pulled out my Bible, the book of Acts, but we're still looking at the life of Peter here, some of these different circumstances and, and stories, the things that he went through. Matthew chapter 14, and I'm going to read verses 22 through 31. Chapter 14, verses 22 through 31. It says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. It means he forced them. It was something they didn't want to do. Maybe they wanted to spend time with him, but he constrained them. It was uh, something that he caused them or forced them to do. Verse 23, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Think about that for a minute. It says, and when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's amazing. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this fantastic story that we read here in the Bible. I pray you would please help us this evening to see and understand the lessons that you were teaching the disciples and that we can learn and uh, apply in our lives as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
As I look at this passage, it really is just a fantastic story. What a visual. You think of someone walking on water. How many people have tried to walk on water over the years? I, I don't know. As a kid, I, I always, you, know, you go to the pool or something like that. You try to get something underneath your feet and you walk across. Am I the only one that ever tried to walk across the water? I mean, it, it's a fantastic visual, what was in the scripture here. And, and we see what he did. But in totality, as we look at the story, we really see a struggle. We see a battle between fear and faith. We see the disciples that were uh, just, just afraid of the, the winds and the waves. They were afraid of the, the spirit that they believed Jesus was at, at that time on the, on the water. They were troubled, uh, crying out in fear. And then we see Dr Jesus address the fear. And we see that whole battle all over again on an individual basis when it comes to Peter getting out of the ship as well. And let me say that it's easy sometimes to look at collective or corporate or group struggles that people have. We look at our nation and we think of the troubles that our nation goes through. It's easy to look at the economy as a whole. It's easy to look at uh, cities and, and organizations maybe as a whole, the church and different things. But the struggles that groups have, individuals have also. This church may struggle in different ways, but individuals deal with those things themselves as well. We don't, we're not saved as, as groups. De God deals with the individual. And yes, they as a group were, uh, were in fear of what was happening, but God dealt with them and gave them commands and particularly dealt with this individual, Peter, in this story. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1 quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I always forget and tell you to keep your finger in the other passage after I tell you to turn somewhere else. 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It says here, desiring to be teachers of the law. I'm sorry, I'm in 1 Timothy. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. We see in the story we just read in Matthew chapter 14 that Jesus addresses their fear and, uh, and gives them faith with his command, come. He calls for them to come to him. And that is the command that Jesus gives to all who struggle with fear. We live in a society that is ruled by fear. People have uh, power and control that they take through fear. You turn on the television set and you may hear one or two human interest stories. They'll talk about one nice thing that happened or something. But the majority of the stories on there are to elicit fear because fear allows them to take control. Fear is what is often used in marketing, a fear of missing out, things that you uh, should have that someone else doesn't have. And that's the story that the world tells us is the story of fear. We have a society that lives in fear of all sorts of things, health concerns, financial concerns, I mean, the car breaking down, the finance, uh, the, uh, the, the house being taken, all sorts of different things. And people prey on our fears. But the answer to fear is drawing close to Jesus. He says to them, he says, come. And he says to us the same thing. We see in 2 Timothy in this passage, uh, the, the verse there, we read about the spirit of fear, uh, of power and of love and of a sound mind. But the next verse says, therefore, it, it, it talks about, you know, the, the next thing that we're supposed to do, it says, be not thou therefore ashamed of the a testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but, and he tells us what to do. He says, be thou partaker, be thou partaker. He says, be a partaker. He says, don't separate yourself. Don't let fear cause you to, to separate from the things that God has called us to. But he says, let it be something that draws you closer to be involved, to be a partaker, closer and closer. And I'll say it again, the solution to fear is to draw closer to Jesus. But how do we do that? How do we draw closer? Well, let's look at the example that we see in the life of Peter here in Matthew chapter 14. The first thing, and this is very similar to what we saw when he was up on the rooftop. In verse 29 of chapter 14, it says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, we know it goes on. It says he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But before Peter walked on the water, before Jesus or Peter embarked on his uh, journey to Jesus, he first had to get 
out of the ship. He had to leave behind the situation that he was in before. He had to leave behind his friends. He had to leave behind even the other disciples. And it's important that we remember our relationship with Jesus is not dependent upon other believers. Our relationship with Jesus is not dependent on this world around us. It's not dependent on our circumstances. It's not dependent upon whether our finances are going well or our business or the other things that are happening around us. Our relationship with Jesus needs to be separate from all these other things. There will be a, turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24. We see Joshua make this proclamation here. He says, no matter what everyone else is doing, I'll tell you what I have chosen. And he says in this passage, he starts out Joshua 24, 15. He says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. He says, hey, even if you disagree with me, even if you even if you, you're on the other side of this, he says, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers, uh, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. He says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He knew that this was going to be a time of separation. He knew that this was going to be something that other people were going to disagree with. And I don't believe that this was him being insecure saying, I don't know what y'all are going to do. I'm not sure, but he says, hey, even if you're going to separate from me, even if you're going to be on the other side of the line here uh, doing other things, he says, I know what the Lord has called me to do, and I choose to serve the Lord. And if we are going to move from fear to faith, we are going to have to separate ourselves from the world. The majority of this world is ruled by fear. The majority of this world is headed the wrong direction. We have to separate ourselves. I love fellowship at church. I love spending time with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I think some of the best fellowship that I have is out knocking doors and talking to folks about Jesus. And it's encouraging to me to have conversations about the things that are going on in our lives. But at the same time, we cannot become dependent upon the fellowship. Hey, and there is, there is a command from the scripture to be in church. And, and I believe that fellowship is a part of the reasoning behind that command. But what if the other believers around you push you in the wrong direction. And that happens in church. No church is perfect. You're going to come to church and there are going to be people around you that are going to sometimes discourage you. They're going to say things that are, that are not helpful, things that push you in the wrong direction. What are you going to do? Are you going to be so dependent upon that fellowship, upon that peer pressure that, that you can't have the right relationship with God? We see that in places. We see people that leave fundamentalism, that leave uh, Christian churches and leave uh, the Bible and, and leave truth. And you say, why did that happen? Well, someone said X. Someone did X. And, and you say, well, what about your relationship with the Lord? Is it dependent on other people or is it dependent on the Lord? And, and there, there are going to be times when peer pressure pushes us in the wrong direction. And when that happens, what are we going to do? We have to get out of the boat. Just say, hey, I, I, I don't, I don't, this is going to sound terrible. I don't need the encouragement of my husband. I don't need the encouragement of my wife. I don't need my pastor to pat me on the back or to say this is good or to encourage me. I have a walk with the Lord that keeps me steady and walking beside him. And because of that, I'm not going to fear. I'm going to be able to continue in the truth and what God has called me to. Colossians chapter three and verse 23 and 24. You know this, it says, in whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord. And is it, in case people are confused, you know, in case that isn't clear enough, I, I love how he does this in several verses. He says, you know, in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, he says, you know, and, and not of also, in case you get confused, but he says here, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And I, I'll tell you, it has been a comfort, a great comfort to me in my personal life that the Lord sees and the Lord knows. Hey, people will wrong us. People will not give the encouragement that, that quite frankly, sometimes we're deserving of. Something that, you know, that you, know, you see, it doesn't make sense. Someone else got you know, this recognition. Someone else received this reward, this blessing, whatever it is. But the Lord sees and the Lord knows. And I'll say that receiving a reward at the hand of the Lord is much better than receiving a reward at the hand of a man. Right. His rewards are far better. What a blessing. There are times that the Lord will call you, though, to do something that he doesn't call everyone else to do. 
I'm not saying you're getting an extra biblical revelation. What I'm saying is there are different works that different people are called to do. And here in this passage, we see that Peter, he was called to get out of the boat. And when he was called to get out of the boat, he couldn't look to the person beside him and say, well, are, are you, Andrew, are, are you going to get out of the boat with me? Are you called to do this as well? Are you going to go soul winning with me? Are you going to go and help me out in this ministry? Are you going to? No, he had to step out of the boat and continue in the work that God had called him to do, no matter what support he had received. The question I have here in application is, when was the last time that you did something for the Lord that nobody else was doing? You weren't relying on support from anywhere else. Not your husband, not your wife, not the folks in your church, not your best friend. You going down the list. But it was something the Lord spoke to your heart and said, hey, I want you to spend some extra time in prayer in this area. Hey, I want you to go ahead and do a little bit more in this area. I want you to, to, to work in this area of your life. And, and you didn't say, wait, wait, are you going to do this with me? Are you going to do this with me? But instead, you, you stepped out of the boat. You said, Lord, I'm willing to do it no matter whether anyone else is going to do it with me as well. The first step in moving from fear to faith is being ready to step out of the boat, depending on the Lord and not the people around us. The second thing we see here, I want to look in verse 29. It says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, we read that there, it says he, and the next word is walked. Say it with me. He walked. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. He walked. And the Bible doesn't say that he, he ran. The Bible doesn't say that he took the boat over to Jesus, you know. The Bible doesn't say that, I mean, you think about it, out of the water. If somebody calls for me to come to them out in the water, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to the rudder of the boat, and I'm going to turn the boat around, and I'm going to head to that person. <laughs> that's the natural inclination. That, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. I don't know what, was, what exactly his first inclination, but he didn't run. He didn't ride a boat. He didn't uh, take a, a motorcycle. He wasn't he wasn't instantly transported to Jesus when Jesus called for him to come. Hey, sometimes, sometimes people think that there's going to be some supernatural intervention. God calls me to do this, and bam, it's going to be so easy. I'm just going to be right there, and everything's going to be so smooth. And easy. No, no, the Bible tells us here that he walked. And the interesting thing, and I believe this is an application from the Word of God here, the interesting thing, when you look at this idea of walking, the idea of walking, you can't walk without taking steps. You can't walk without taking steps. You, you have to move from one place to the next to the next. Like I said, he wasn't instantly transported. He didn't hop and end up right there at once. He walked closer and closer to Jesus. He took steps. I heard someone say a long time ago, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? Anyone know the answer? How do you eat an elephant? This is great doctrinal help. Will help. Yes? Well, how do you? One bite at a time. One bite at a time. Now, I am probably the slowest eater in this room. I am... I am, I am a slow eater. If I'm at the office and I take a bite, I'll, I'll start into my lunch and two hours later I'll be finishing it. You know, I, I am a slow eater. I get distracted, and I, you know, whatever. But the way you, you, the way you eat great amounts of food is by continuing to eat. You take one bite at a time. The way you accomplish great tasks, the way that you uh, get to the end of, of uh, distant journeys or long journeys is to take one step at a time. And that's what we see in Peter's life. When, when he was called to Jesus, he took steps. And it's a reminder that the Christian life is not about great leaps. It's not about monstrous jumps forward all of a sudden, but the Christian life is about consistent, constant steps forward. It's said that people far overestimate what they can accomplish in a short amount of time. Well, by the next year, I can get this done. I can uh, accomplish this in my life and my personal growth, but they far underestimate what they can do in the long term over the 20 years, over the 30 years, over the course of their lifetime. If you put in the time every day to read God's word, it's amazing. If you memorize a scripture every day, if you do these things consistently and you walk with the Lord, you will see some amazing leaps in your spiritual life. The same is true in, in physical endeavors. You look at people that you know, get, are inconsistent in their exercise. You look at someone who uh, you know, gets all excited about it come January 1st. They've got a New Year's resolution. Those gyms are full up. The memberships are, you know, the membership rolls. They swell. Everyone gets all excited. And then you know, two months later, you, you don't see them at the gym. They're, they're not doing anything. And, and, and that's the way it is. But you look at those people. They may do just a little bit. 
but they're there every day. They're there three times a week. They're, they're, they're there on a consistent basis, years and years. And you see and the, the way that it affects their, their health. And, and the same thing is true when it comes to spiritual matters. Consistent, constant steps forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. I, I like the picture it shows us here. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. And then it says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. He says, don't stop. Don't quit. Don't let anyone move you back. It says unmovable. It's not talking about being unmoved backwards. He's saying unmoved from the path, unmoved from the course that God has put you on. He says always abounding, always moving forward. There's always something that's being done in your life. We see this over and over again. Hey, the Christian life is a life of growth, a, a, a life of constant progress and, and moving forward. And, and when it says here to be steadfast, unmovable, we can be steadfast because our heavenly father is steadfast. He's unchanging. He's always the same. And the call here is for us to stay faithful. I love to see Christians that are excited about something the Lord has given to them. I, I, I love that. It, it, it gets me excited seeing people that are excited. And hey, be more excited than the pastor, please. I'd rather, I'd rather have to you know, tell people, all right, well, let's be a little more consistent than to have to you know, light a fire under someone and get them going. That, that's the truth. I don't, want to put a, I don't want to put a damper on anyone. But th the reality is here, what I want to see is people constantly and consistently moving forward. You know, many times in the ministry in Nepal, uh, I, start, I, I, love, I love working with young people. I work with these young men, and they had ideas for how we could move this ministry forward, the young people that we could minister to. And why don't we jump into this? And why don't we do that? We can expand in here. And I would say, well, let's look at the future. How, how is that going to affect us over the next year, over the next five years? Where are we going to be at? And I would rather see those small incremental steps forward. Hey, I'm not saying stop. I'm not saying move backwards, but I want to see cons consistent and constant progress in the right direction more than I want to see leaps and bounds that will eventually be undone by Satan where you fall backward again. Stay faithful. Move forward. Galatians chapter six and verse nine says, let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we make great leaps and bounds. No, that's not what it says. If we faint not. Hey, I don't know, I look around me sometimes and I see some preachers and I see some ministries and the things that the Lord is doing in certain people's lives. And I think, man, well, that, the Lord is really using that preacher. That ministry right there, that, that's, that's a great thing. But you know what I can do? I can faint not. I can continue. I can continue to take those small and incremental steps, just never stop. And, and that's what he's calling us to. And that's what we see here in the life of Peter. He gets out of the boat and he doesn't make a, a great leap to the Lord in an instant. But the Bible tells us that he walked to Jesus. He walked to Jesus. And I want to encourage you, take steps over and over every day, every area of your life, year after year. And it is amazing what the Lord will do in your life. Don't forget Philippians 1 and verse 6, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hey, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't stop the work while here, we're here on this earth. It's something we're consistently and constantly growing in the Lord. Don't have the expectation that it's going to happen all at once. Next week, I'm going to be the perfect Christian. No, you're not. You're going to continue to grow. You're going to continue to improve. You're going to continue to draw closer to the Lord. We see, how did he draw closer to the Lord? First of all, he left the boat. Second of all, he took steps. He took steps. The, the third, thing, third thing we see here in verse 26. Turn back to Matthew 14. Verse 26 here. At the beginning of the story, we see the disciples in fear because they thought they saw a spirit. It says, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. I mean, this had to be pretty terrifying for them. I don't know how often I see grown men cry out in fear. 
And these are fishermen. These are men that have been out of the water. I guarantee they've seen a lot. They've seen miracles. They've seen some unusual things in the life and ministry of, of, of Jesus Christ. But here are these grown men on the sea, troubled, crying out with fear. And they hear the assurances of Jesus. And I can assume that their fear was relieved in some way, at least. But now Jesus has bid Peter to come out of the boat. So we see, first of all, follow with me here. First of all, there's great fear. Then Jesus comforts them. But that wasn't the end of the story. Jesus then calls for Peter to get out of the boat. And as Peter left the boat, there were new trials. Verse 24 says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. That boat right there, it was, it was still in those um, boisterous winds. It was still in the, uh, in the midst of this storm. Verse 30 says, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. It was still tossed by the waves. It was still, uh, there was still a contrary wind. And so we see this progression. First, there was a spirit on the water, but now Peter was exposed to the elements in the storm. And I, I want to point out here, I hope you'll follow with me, when Peter obeyed Jesus, calling for him to get out of the boat, when he obeyed the Savior, he stepped out of the boat into a new trial. And there was already something difficult that they were dealing with. And Jesus had given them that comfort. He had come, and I'll tell you, that, that probably comforted their hearts. But then God called him to something new that exposed him in a new way. And when God, when God leads us forward in our spiritual life, we have to understand that every time, every step that we take is not going to be protected and peaceful and you know comfortable is the word I'm trying to think. We're protected in the right way. You know what I'm saying when I, when I say protected. But there will be new trials. There will be new risks. There will be new difficulties. And the reality is that Satan doesn't just hear that a believer has a new endeavor in mind for the Lord. That, that lady, she wants, to, she wants to spend extra time in prayer. You know what? I just give up. I, I, that is just too much for me. No, that's not what Satan does. Satan at that point tries to introduce every distraction that he possibly can, everything that he can to keep that lady who's made that decision to, con, you know, from continuing in it. And I don't care what it is. If there is something good that a believer decides to do for the Lord, whether it be an act of service, whether it be uh, in our Bible time and our walk with the Lord, whether it be in leading our families, whether it be in our finances, whether it be in church attendance, I don't care what it is. Satan wants to stop it. And we cannot expect that just because we get out of the boat and we're headed in the right direction toward Jesus, everything's going to be hunky-dory. No, he stepped out of the boat into new risk, new trials in that situation. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And we have to be careful that we don't assume that the difficulties of this life are the hand of God stopping us. You know, some people, oh, well, that's a sign. I woke up this morning and my, it was dark outside. And I said, man, I can't read my Bible today. It's a sign from the Lord. I, I can't do it. No. <laughs> people can take all sorts of things as a sign of something or whatever. What did God lead you to do through the word of God, the truth that you can count on, that you can rest on, that is unchanging? You stick with that and you continue in it. Don't let it be determined by the circumstances around us. He encountered new trials, but that didn't mean that Jesus didn't call him. Jesus had called him to walk on the water. Hey, take the time to examine the storm. Take the time to examine the trials. I, I, I don't want to, you don't want to walk through life just saying, well, the devil's out to get me. Maybe, it's the, maybe it is the Lord. You know, there are some situations where the Lord does, you know, send you a wake-up call. He sends some trials to move you back to the place where he wants you to be. But examine those things. Make sure that you're doing what the Lord wants you to do. And if that's the case, then continue in that calling. We see in Ephesians chapter 6, the verses around the, the spiritual battle that we're in. We can't, we can't just stick our heads in the sand and, and ignore the fact that we are in a battle. There's a fight. Following Jesus does not exempt us from the storms of life. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. 
2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, say it with me, suffer persecution. Shall suffer persecution. It's an expectation. It, it's something that we, we ought to understand. And I'll tell you, it, it is a difficult thing for believers that have an unrealistic mindset when it comes to our expectations in the Christian life. And then they get slapped upside the head by the devil. And they, well, oh no, and they give up and they quit and they, it's something they didn't see. Hey, we have to have the right expectations. As we continue to follow the Lord, there will be new trials. As he was journeying from faith or from fear to faith, we see that he had to leave the boat. We see that he took steps. We see that he encountered new trials along the way. I want to see quickly in verse 29, something quite simple here. It says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water Read those last four verses, words with me. To go to Jesus. To go to Jesus. Peter didn't just jump out of the boat and run around the boat a few times. Hey, this is fun. I want to enjoy it. Hey, I, I don't know. I might have, I don't know. I might have been distracted by having a little fun, you know. But he didn't do that. When he got out of the boat, the Bible tells us that he went to Jesus. He had a goal in this journey. He had a goal in this walk here. He wanted to obey. And more specifically, he wanted to get closer to Jesus. And the question is, believer, if someone walks up to you in your Christian life and says, Brother Terry, what is the goal in your life? And hey, there are a lot of things that we see in the scriptures as far as commands of God and things that he leads us to do. And I hope that you know there are, there are certain areas that we focus on at different times as we have weaknesses and whatnot. But do we have a goal? Do we have a goal that's on the top of our mind that we can give an answer to anyone? You know, if someone asks us, what is the purpose of this life? Why are you doing these things? You can say, yes, because I want to grow closer to Jesus. Man, what, what a goal that was. What a goal. When he got out of the boat, he got out of the boat to go to Jesus. What do we have our eyes fixed on? What is it that when we wake up in the morning, we consider? I hope it's not just what is the next task on my to-do list. And I'm just as guilty as, as the rest of us. Hey, you know, I look at the things that I need to get done for the day, you know, after the beginning. But, but do we have our eyes on a goal, on the goal of growing closer to the Lord and, and, and continuing what he has called us to do? Something that we go to bed in the evening, evaluating our progress on. How have I progressed in this? Have I drawn closer to the Lord? Is there something that he's showing me that he's moving me toward? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. What an image he's put in front of us, this race here. We've set these things aside. We've got a goal. There are people that are watching. Verse 2, it starts out, it says, Looking unto, the next word, Jesus looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hey, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the goal. This world is so full of distractions, things that will pull our attention away. And, and, and we see what, what happened with, with Peter here. But he started out with a goal. We see churches that lose sight of their, their goal. They lose sight of the, the reason that they're there. They turn into country clubs and, and they turn into you know, all sorts of other things. And I, this, I'm not going to make a list of it tonight. We don't, we don't have time. But let me just say that Satan doesn't just distract individuals. Satan doesn't just distract the unbeliever. He distracts the church. He tries to pull us away from the purpose that God has given us. It's important that we don't lose sight of our goal that we don't turn to serving ourselves, that we don't turn to playing and purchasing and pursuing the things of this world. Man, that was a three-point P outline right there off the top of my head. But let's be careful that we do not turn away from our goal of getting closer to Jesus. Don't let our eyes wander. We see that Peter drew closer to the Lord by leaving the boat, taking steps, encountered these new trials. We see he had a goal. The last thing I see here is that he had new faith. Verse 30, we see it says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. 
and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Hey, there was already comfort. There was, there was faith in some way when he had stepped out of the boat. Uh, it take, I don't know about you, but it, it seems like it takes a little faith to step out of the boat and see what happens. I mean, to trust the Lord, to do that. That, that's, that takes some faith. He, he, he had turned to the Lord. He did it. But at the end, he needed new faith. He had to call on the Lord. Lord, save me. And that's what faith is. You know, casting ourselves upon the Savior, putting ourselves in his hand, turning to him. And I don't think that anyone would look at the life of Peter, even up until this point in his ministry, and say that Peter was not a man of faith. I, I think all of us would agree. Peter was a man of faith. But yesterday's faith is not enough for today. I'll say it again. Yesterday's faith is not enough for today. Any more than yesterday's Bible reading is enough for today. Yesterday's church attendance is enough for the rest. Hey, hey, yesterday's faith is not enough for today. We have to continue to grow in faith. We have new trials. We have new difficulties. We have new, uh, new battles to fight uh, spiritually. We need new faith for those as well. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 29 Verse, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 9, verse 24, it says, And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Help thou mine unbelief. Hey, I don't care where you're at spiritually, what faith you have in your life, there needs to be advancement in that. There has to be new faith for the new things that God calls us to do. The Christian life is a life of faith. Every work that he calls us to do it requires faith. If we're going to do it in the way that he wants us to do, hey, you can, you can do it for man's applause. You can do it with the wrong motivations, but that's not what God's calling us to do. What he calls us to do when it comes to serving him is by faith. Every act, everything the Lord calls us to requires faith. The Bible tells us that our, our eating requires faith. I mean, just everything. In uh, Romans chapter 14, it says, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I mean, he just draws it down into what we would consider something that we can do without even thinking many times. And he says, everything requires faith. But where does this faith come from? Well, Romans 10, 17, it says it quite simply. You know this. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hey, we have to come to, and I don't have time to go into all this, but we understand that Jesus Christ is the living word. He is the one that we draw close to. And we, we need to spend time in the word of God with Jesus Christ so that we can have the faith that we need for each new trial and each new day. If we want to follow the Apostle Peter's example, if we want to move from fear, from the difficulties that we have, to faith, we have to follow his example and grow in faith. There needs to be new faith. How did Peter draw closer to the Lord in the storm? Number one, he left the boat. Number two, he, he took steps toward the Lord. Number three, he encountered new trials. Number four, he had a goal in that. And number five, he had new faith as he moved forward. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the example that we see here in the scripture. Lord, I, I don't know what it is that each person is dealing with, but I know that we all have fears in our lives, things that we're concerned with, things that we struggle with. But Lord, I pray you would help us to move from that place of fear to faith. And I don't know which of these areas that, that we see the example in the life of Peter that each of us need, but Lord, I pray you would help us to, to step forward and make that move. We pray this in Jesus' name. The piano plays this evening. I hope that you look at this story and see something that you could do in your life. You say, maybe there are some things that I need to separate from some things that I've been relying on more than I ought to. People that are not pushing me in the right direction necessarily, and I need to step out of the boat. Maybe you say there are some unrealistic expectations in my spiritual life. I've been expecting to take some great leaps and bounds where the reality is I just need to settle in and be consistent and move forward in those steps. I need to understand that there are going to be difficulties along the way. Maybe you'd say I've been distracted from Jesus Christ and drawing closer to him. I want to make sure that I keep that goal in focus in my life. However the Lord spoke to your heart this evening, take a moment and talk to him.